Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Appeal, helping you enjoy your fruits and vegetables at peak freshness and reduce food waste. Learn more at appeal.com. Welcome to Cooking in Mexican from A to Z. I'm Aaron Sanchez, your host. And I'm Sarela Martinez. I'm the A and my mom's the Z, just in case you didn't know. Uh, today we're going to be talking about no big deal, no big subject, just cacao to chocolate. No big deal. Uh, we are honored and privileged to have the presence of Andy Coe here. Andy, man, you talk about a resume, you talk about life experiences. Pretty, pretty awesome. Andy is a writer. He's an independent scholar specializing in culinary history. Uh, he grew up with a father that would go to Mexico on archaeological digs, and you would be there learning about the culture, the cuisine, chocolate, your dad and your mom, or is it just your dad that wrote the book on chocolate? Both. Both. A collaborative effort between your parents, and then now you've kind of carried the torch and you've written a book with your wife as well, right? Right. I wrote a book called A Square Meal, A Culinary History of the Great Depression. Which uh, only won a James Beard Award. No big deal. Um, which is fantastic. I love that. You've written books, articles, of course, many blog posts. Uh, everything from ancient history to foie gras uh, to the criminal past of the chocolate egg creams. Which is always a fascinating subject that people <laughs> uh, bug me about all the time. Um, so, Andy... It is an absolute pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. I think we would like to correct the book, the thing of what your parents did. Mm -hmm. your, your, your father wrote the, the first book on what? Well, my father was one of the people who, who helped um, translate um, ancient Maya hieroglyphs. And um, he was like a sort of right in the middle of, of that effort. And he wrote um, the, the big book telling that story called Breaking the Maya Code. That's that's no big deal. <laughs> and then your mom wrote one of my favorite books, America's First Cuisines. Yeah, that was that was a book which talked about what what was the, what was the food that the ancient Aztecs, Mayas, and Incas ate, and it sort of laid the groundwork for for like you know how those foods you know are you know we still eat them today, and how those ingredients like chocolate and tomatoes spread all around the world. Yeah, it's fascinating. And then they collaborated on the, on the whole story of chocolate. Yes, yeah. Well, it was actually an interesting, uh, I mean, it's story, I mean, a sad story, is that my mother started working on the book, which was like an outgrowth of America's First Cuisines, mm -hmm. and then she became ill and realized that she couldn't finish it. And so my father took over um, um, the work on the book and finished it after she passed away. Oh. And you have followed in their footsteps, which is, to me, of great interest because I don't follow it in my footsteps as well. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't expect it, but uh, uh, here I am. Um, I guess, you know, I just was grew up in, you know, like Aron, mm -hmm. you grow up with all it around you, and suddenly you realize that, you know, you'd like to make a place in that world for yourself. Absolutely. And, um, and then, you know, here you are. And what do you think your greatest contributions have been? Um, well, actually, I don't know what my greatest contribution, but I think one of the, sort of the things which I'm, I found most fun was figuring out 
not in the world of you know the new world or not in the world of chocolate, but figuring out um, what was the real story behind chop suey. Oh. Like, was that really a Chinese dish, and um, where did it come from, and why did we eat so much of it, and then why did it disappear? Well, we used to <laughs> we, we used to eat it at that at the ranch. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, my mom used to make it with bacon. She'd get canned water chestnuts. She'd get uh, canned bean sprouts. I mean, this was the fifties. Right. And but we had chop suey all the time <laughs> at the ranch. Let me tell you. It, I, I think I think that's so cool. Isn't that awesome? La Choy Chop Suey. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. As they, as they, well, they, the tagline said, La Choy makes uh, Chinese food swing American. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And, and then Americans swing to it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I love that. So we're going to talk about an ingredient that I think, you know, you talk about the Mesoamerican uh, bevy of ingredients and what are the building blocks of flavor and what defines our cuisine, you know, people would argue chilies, ch- uh, corn, tomatoes, squashes, all those things. But chocolate is really what I think is the backbone. It has such a fascinating history in Mexico. I think let's talk a little bit about the birth of chocolate in Mexico and, you know, our experiences with it and defining some of the different variations of chocolate, because I think that's important, too. Well, we're going to concentrate on, on chocolate as a beverage, but I think we need some background. So, Andy, <laughs> you're the expert. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. Um, well, uh, chocolate um, came is definitely a New World food. It actually, they, now they think it came from... Um, the, high, the Andes, actually, it, they think it came from the, uh, the Ecuadorian Andes and um, spread um, from there. But, but the, you know, how it spread, people don't know. But we do know about 1,000 B.C. it showed up in um, southern Mexico, particularly along um, the coast of what's now um, Chiapas and, and Guatemala, the, the Pacific coast. And that was like the sort of like, you know, Tierra Natal of, uh, of uh, chocolate in, 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 um, in Mesoamerica. And uh, we know that the ancient Olmecs um, ate chocolate or consumed chocolate, not ate, but consumed. And the Mayas did too. And as you say, we're talking about chocolate as a beverage. Um, they drank their chocolate. They didn't eat chocolate bars, um, but they, um, they roasted it and ground it and put it into drinks um, either with, you know, just with water and spices or with water and ground up cornmeal and spices and honey and other flavorings. Yeah. Chiapas and, and, and um, you know, the coast of Guatemala, you know, right next to it are, are like a rich, lush, trop- hot, tropical environment. And not near the coast, but just, you know, a little bit up uplands going into the mountains is like the perfect environment, kind of semi-jungle environment for the the, the uh, cacao trees to grow because they need they need heat they need moisture and they need shade also because they're understory like trees. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's why they grew there. Well, wow, so so we so we have so let's we define chocolate as a tree, right? Not a plant. Well, it's a tree. Yeah, it's a it's a fruit tree. So you get you have the cacao. It's on the tree. What do we do? You see the beautiful cacao pods, right? How do we get that from what people would have in a beverage in Mexico, ground, beautiful, toasted cacao? How does that process work? Well, you have, you, you, I mean, one of the weird things about cacao is, is that the pods, these beautiful pods, don't grow from the branches, but they grow from the trunk. And oh. so you and um, and uh, so that's when you when you see pictures of the in the ancient Maya you know vases and hieroglyphs you see these like things sprouting from trunks those are cacao pods mm. and so you you take it you peel it um, you take the seeds out and they have to dry mm. and drying and in the drying process you pile them up on the ground they also ferment mm. and that's like the crucial thing to sort of activate the the active ingredients the things like theobromine and mm-hmm. and and the flavor compounds which we love today it's like vanilla Right, and so and then you then you roast it, and then then you can grind it or do whatever you want. But from that, that's that's when it really becomes, um, you know, the the best to eat. So, so, well, you know, I learned how to make chocolate with Soila Mendoza of Totitlan del Valle, mm-hmm. and she taught me how to do everything toasted, how to produce the the patasle, mm-hmm. you know, the right, white the right, white right. white cacao. She taught me all about that. So when I decided I came to to New York. And I decided I was going to invent this wonderful way of doing it by heating my food processor. 
and being able to grind it in there. Mm -hmm. But it turned out to be a fiasco. Mm -hmm. So I went from there to getting my, my metate, mm -hmm. putting it on this gas oven I had outside, heating it like that, and, and Aaron was waking up late as usual. Mm -hmm. and he looks out, and he looks out into the yard. I lived in a house then. And he says, what, what you doing, Mom? Making chocolate? Listen. And I said, yep. Mm -hmm. He said, that's heavy. <laughs> <laughs> it's heavy duty. So you learned from the wonderful Sola Mendoza from Teotitlan del Valle, which is in Oaxaca. Beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, you know, your, your second book, The Food and Life of Oaxaca, is an absolute must for people who, who want to learn more about Oaxaca. It's become so popular and in vogue. But one of the things I remember very distinctly in my travels to Oaxaca is going to a molenillo or to like a place where they grind fresh chocolate for you. And people to, to Americans, they might think this is crazy. But you basically walk into a shop that has these huge grinders that almost look like a cement, like a mini cement truck kind of thing. And they're throwing in these beautiful beans with sugar and Mexican cinnamon, canela, and they're grinding it for you. And you, get, you walk out, in essence, with a warm bag of chocolate. And there's something so amazing. You can see the essential oils, how, how it glazes the outside of this puree. And then that, in turn, becomes champorrado in beverages or added to moles and very other th various other things. But one of the things I was interested in is they have an amargo, a semi-amargo, and almendrado, right? Uh, so it's bitter, semi-bitter, and all, one With that almonds, has almonds right. in it. Um, can you talk a little bit about what, how, what, what the differences are? I mean, well, from semi amargo, is it drying versus that, that you know I what I mean? You don't know? I mean that I can't tell you because um, I. Um, but I mean, uh, there are all kinds of varieties of cacao. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the two. I mean, the the beans themselves. I mean, we're talking about the Latin name is Theobroma cacao, um, but there are other kinds of cacao as well, which which some of which are edible. And then the two great big varieties of, of Theobroma cacao are the Criollo right. and the Forastero. The Criollo is like the real Mexican good chocolate. That's like the, you know, the really high quality stuff. And the Forastero is the stuff which makes Hershey's and Mars bars. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, there's good Forastero, but generally it's, 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 it's like you know, industrial grade gotcha. product. That's what my mom, when the first time I went to Tabasco, my mother said, you're not going to find anything here because Hershey's buys all the cacao from here and the people, all that people have to do is throw a cacao bean on the floor, on the ground, and it becomes money. <laughs> well, it's the same thing in Cuba. When I went to work, when I traveled in Cuba, the Hershey had, were the first people that built in uh, railroads all over the, all over the country. Uh, for, 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 is there a town uh, called Hershey? Yeah, in, yeah, in, in Cuba. In yep. Cuba? That's yeah, right, yeah, yeah. I mean, pretty, pretty, pretty interesting how the how the cacao and the chocolate has talk about an ingredient that has traveled the world. You know, we talked about this book earlier, Near a Thousand Tables, and this particular author talks about something called the uh, Columbus Exchange, which is basically, you know, and I know you know something where an ingredient is native to one area, but allowed to flourish in another environment. So, like, tomatoes are being grown in southern Italy, but they're from Mexico because uh, the thought process is that they're at the same latitude that has very similar weather patterns and, and soil. What are your thoughts on that? Like well, how yeah. That, yeah. And it's amazing to see, I mean, you know, you take, I mean, maybe I'm jumping ahead of myself, but yeah. dishes like mole, yeah. which, uh, like, you know, the, the classic mole poblano takes, like, ingredients from the old world and the new world and makes this, I mean, it's like an incredible syncretism of, 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 of the, you know, the whole Colombian exchange is sort of, that's it in, in like a sauce. Yeah, exactly. But, I mean, but, the sweetness, the lard, the chocolate, the chilies, the, you know, the, the old world spices. I mean, they all, they're all there. One little thing. Yeah. It's very clear, very important to mention here that not all moles have chocolate. Exactly. And so let me <laughs> describe a mole. A mole is a pureed sauce that has a things base of like onion, mm -hmm. onion, well, either green or dried chilies. It has a thickener of some kind, almonds, nuts, masa, uh, bread. bread, you know, or all of the above. Plus it has some of the things like onions and garlic, and then sometimes it has chocolate. And I think people hang on to that. We were speaking about that earlier. People hang on to that because it's such a novelty to have chocolate in a savory application. You know what I mean? And I think that's why people hang on to that. I mean, you look at, there's an Italian recipe with uh, chocolate pappardelli with a wild boar ragu. 
just to give you an idea of like how the cacao has infiltrated in other cultures, you know. Now, the question I have that I'm sure all of our listeners are really intrigued by, what other regions of the world grow chocolate? And are there any other regions of the world that's not the new world that grows chocolate? Oh, my God, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Most chocolate in the world, the great majority of chocolate in the world is – is um, grown in West Africa, um, the, the Ivory Coast and the countries um, right around there. And that's the, what I was talking about, the cheap industrial chocolate. And um, the, the quality is very low, um, and there's a lot of issues with the way that they treat the workers. Mm -hmm. There's child labor going on. There's some slave, slave labor going on, and there's all – I mean, they're ter cutting down the jungle to plant chocolate trees, and it's, it's not a good okay. situation for the world. Um, but then you go, I mean, you know, just spanning the globe and, and all, you know, in the sort of belt of the tropics all around the world, you have chocolate being grown in Vietnam now. Wow. Unbelievable. Um, you know, Sumatra. I mean, you know, all um, and, you know, all over South America, all over the Caribbean. And hey, what do they um, do with it? Well, it depends. Um, I mean, right now there's, you know, the bean, it, uh, places like Vietnam, the bean to bar craze is really big. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a lot of um, – you have small producers who are trying to produce really high-quality chocolate because the Japanese love high-quality chocolate and will pay a lot of money for it. And it's also closer to them. Right. I imagine will affect the price. Yes, exactly. And they can travel there to, to, uh, to, yeah. to you know, the, the chocolate farms and, and see it. And so um, that's like a big influence on, uh, on that. And, and, they're think, you know, and also in I India and China – have now are now discovering a taste for chocolate, mm. so those markets are expanding. So you know, people all across Asia are thinking maybe we should start planting chocolate trees now. Wow! Now let's talk, mommy, because we're talking about the the we, some of the cultural inflections of how important chocolate is. Obviously, in Mexican culture, it has been tapped as a as a sort of uh, aphrodisiac, an elixir that was consumed by by uh, indigenous royalty, right? Can we talk a little bit about that folklore and how that kind of came about? Well, well there's stories, right? Like, well, I, what they say is, um, including um, in my parents' book, The True History of Chocolate, um, uh, my parents say it, is that um, the folklore of that, that um, chocolate was an aphrodisiac, you know, in Mesoamerica was um, mostly invented by the Spaniards because they were obsessed with sexual prowess. Yeah, they were obsessed with sexual prowess and constipation yeah. because of their of their diet, yeah. you know, like lard and and pork. Yeah, um, and so so they were always wanted to find things which could like help them perform, and um, and they just somehow decided that this that chocolate was the one that it was the beverage would al allow the you know the Aztec emperors um, to do that. Yeah, well, there was this saying that you know Montezuma was a uh, an Aztec priest. And the way that he uh, abstained from having sex, he had his genitals wrapped in thorns. <laughs> and then apparently he drank f ten, 10 cups of, of champurrado or liquid chocolate and he performed like a like an animal, like a beast, you know. I haven't about. heard that story. Well, I, it's, I've, I've read I'm it. Sure, yeah. <laughs> I mean, how can I make that up? <laughs> anyway, yeah. The, you know, there was something we touched briefly on chocolate as a beverage. But there's a tradition of having chocolate with sweet bread mm -hmm. and atole with tamales. Yes. So you go to the to the market in Oaxaca, for instance, and they have amazing displays of sweet bread, and they make this wonderful chocolate with with a molinillo. So I'd like to talk about the foam beverages. Well, as as I said before, chocolate was a beverage. Primer, I mean, um, totally in Mesoamerica, they did not eat chocolate as food. They didn't have chocolate candy bars or anything like that. They drank their chocolate, and. Um, they, you know, they want. They had various sort of requirements for what the what the chocolate, you know, this this chocolate beverage is supposed to be like, and it had what high quality chocolate would have a foamy head on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, just like we have like a coffee, like an espresso with some crema on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This um, they wanted their chocolate to be foamy, and so um, they didn't have the molinillo, which is the, which is kind of like the wooden whisk, which would whisk up the foam. Um, so what they did was pour chocolate from a height from – and you see this on like ancient Maya vases. Um, they would pour chocolate from like three or four feet up in the air into a pot on the ground and that you know, would land in there and, and the foam would bubble up. 
And you were first supposed to drink the foam because that was like, you know, the cream, the best part. And then, and then you would drink the, drink the chocolate. So they always wanted that kind of foamy texture um, that was like, it's, it's kind of like a milkshake. Yeah. Well, and, there's a lot of foam dishes, drinks in, in Oaxaca and Veracruz, yeah. Vupu, you know, which has the, an orchid in it and the, and the cacao, and it's very, very foamy. Mm-hmm. Can, can you talk a little bit, Andy, about, you know, your father and, and, and your background in the archaeological side of things that they were discovering in sites, some different kinds of pottery can you elaborate a little bit about about that? Because I find well, that one of the one of the so I as a kid, um, um, you know, my father was an archaeologist, and we would spend every summer um, in Mexico going around to archaeological sites. And um, and when my father was, um, you know, when he was digging sites, he d- d- dug the big uh, Olmec site of San Lorenzo in Veracruz. Um, we were um, put to work in his lab. Um, cleaning the pot shirts and cleaning the pots. We had, you know, we would have like a toothbrush and, you know, a little pot of water and we'd be scrubbing away. And we realize now that that was a mistake because now they have um, various kinds of equipment which can analyze residue on pot shirts and figure out what the pots held. Mm. And and for and now they they looked at the residue of pots all across Mesoamerica, pots which were buried in tombs by you know by by the side of like you know aristocrats and kings and things like that, and they discovered that in the pots was chocolate, because they found theobromine, the main alkaloid in chocolate, um, you know in that residue, and this isn't and this is pots you know going down into Central America and pots as far north as Puebla Bonita in the American Southwest, because that shows the spread of ancient Mesoamerican culture and, you know, both religion and, you know, culture, like, you know, you you need, you know, if if you're sophisticated in Mesoamerica at that time, you drank chocolate because that's what the, like, the kings of Mexico consumed. It was considered a a status symbol. Hot, completely status. And it was, and the tributes, you know, because a lot of the, the, the ancient Mexicans paid tributes to the to the leaders and one of the big items was cacao beans and one of the things that I read that I loved was that at one time it was money mm-hmm. and yeah. people would accumulate this thing but they had to eat it and, and, and share it otherwise it would rot so the, the, the wealth was transitory and then it gave mm-hmm. them status but they had to get rid of it Right. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, and, and it was not just cur- you know, currency or tribute for the kings, but it was also currency in the markets. Yep. A rabbit would cost three cacao beans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. You know, and then it would just go on, you know, on from there. And, and of course, we, for the tributes, like if, if the Aztecs conquer uh, a king, you know, down, at, down on the Gulf Coast, the king has to send like 100,000 cacao beans to Mexico City. Gotcha. So let's talk a little bit about... So if you're one of these great pasteliers in France, for instance, or Belgium or Germany, which uh, Switzerland, you know, you talk about these places that uh, hang their hat on their chocolate confections and, and skill with chocolate. Like, where are they getting their chocolate? Are they using Mexican chocolate or, you know, like, I'm interested to see how that happens. Well, they I mean, they're sourcing their chocolate from, you know, h- high quality producers. I mean, if you take like a... A Valrona, for uh, exactly. A Valrona. I mean, you, the bars will tell you, you know, it's uh, where the the chocolate is from. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, like a classic Valrona cooking bar will will be just like you know multiple origin. Yeah. But they have all these single bo- origin bars. You know, they'll say you know seventy five percent cacao um, from the know, Orinoco River in Venezuela yeah, exactly. or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So it it is extremely regional, and now because there's this transparency with food more so than it's ever been. You know, you look at what IBM is doing with their blockchain technology, where you're basically able to source where ingredients are from. I had to throw in that little IBM plug because I, <laughs> I work with them and they're awesome. But there are really, but they are also helping the individual farmer in places like Mexico that are that are cacao farmers that will have a voice. So just you know, with that being said. Um, Let's. What, what do you think is the most, talking about chocolate and beverages, what would be the most iconic beverage in Mexico utilizing chocolate? Champorrado, right? Champorrado. So let's talk a little bit to our listeners what champorrado is, because Andy was so generous and thoughtful of bringing some champorrado here. Well, it's based with an atole, which is a, a corn gruel, shall we say mm-hmm. that? 
This is not a good word for a delicious thing. Mm -hmm. And then you add the chocolate, and then you beat it. So, but but when you say corn gruel, I thought in essence it's a thin down masa. So you're taking masa in essence and thinning it down with water, right? How would we explain what an atole is so we can start with that? Well, I think a gruel is a great word. Yeah. That's, 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 I mean, that's what it is. Yeah. It's a, it's a sort of um, um, ground grain, um, you know, like a puree of ground grains. Yeah. And, um, and you know, the word atoli, you know, goes back to Nahuatl. I mean, you yeah. know, this, this is something which, you know, the, the Indians of ancient Mesoamerica consumed every day. This was like um, not it just – Like congee. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like kanji or something like yeah. that. But it got it, it going. Yeah, and and it was and it was uh, it was healthy. It was nutritious, and it was it didn't cost much to 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 make because you didn't have to light a fire to mm. make it. You would just like you know you had the, you just like mix it up and and in there it's it's like an instant meal. Oh, wonderful! But you know they take this simple dish, the simple drink. And then they would add all kinds of incredible ingredients like, you know, ground flowers and vanilla mm. and, you know, achiote and, and, you know, t- on and on and on and honey. And so it – and, you know, this was – this could become a drink fit for a king. Yeah, like tascalate is a, the drink in Oaxaca that's like a tole base, but it has – Achote in it, mm. right? Yeah, and they well, and they actually with the achote ones, um, the the conquistadors noticed that after they drank the uh, the atole with the achote, their mouths were and beards were completely covered with like red all over. Yeah, it. with orange rusty yeah. color, no. Yeah, no, and it's true because you know when people, I think what people are fascinated with chocolate, it's one of the few things that a lot of people associate with like cravings and addictions. Like, people have to have it. It's like a coffee. And I think when you look at it like coffee and chocolate, one of the flavor profiles that I think jots out is bitterness, right? You can't get around the bitterness, and people either love it or hate it. And I think people get confused what sour and bitter are. Bitter is what I think defines chocolate in a lot of ways. What are some of the things that come up to you with you when you think about chocolate and all of its complexity? Well, I mean, chocolate, I mean, yeah, the bitter flavor is definitely, I mean, you know, if you've ever had a 100% cacao bar, yeah. I mean, that's pure bitterness. <laughs> yeah. And I know, you know, people who are, you know, chocolate heads, you know, chocolate freaks, and, and that's their preferred, yeah. you know, chocolate. But that's because they've eaten so much chocolate that their senses are dulled. Yeah. Um, but but it, it has, and like, you know, coffee, it has caffeine in it. Mm. Um, but it has like dozens of other, um, in, you know, ingredients and alkaloids like theobromine, which, you know, work together in all kinds of complex ways. I mean, I think so bitterness and complexity, yeah. like good chocolate, those are two things which it has. And, and it has like complexity not in the flavor, um, you know, great chocolate bar will, will, you know, it has like the initial flavor, then the middle flavor, then the end flavor. Like chocolate I mean, chili. It, yeah, it's something which really, sort of, it, it is, you know, incredible food on, you know, so many taste levels. And it has fat. You know, there's like a cho- there's a fattiness to chocolate, the cacao that's really wonderful, that sort of sits on your palate, right? And it lingers, and I think that's why people find it so so fascinating and addictive at times. Well, yeah. it, it, the chocolate that we know of really changed when I think it was the Swiss who discovered conching, no? Right. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about what conching is. Well, conching is a process where you grind the chocolate so it, the, the, the roasted cacao nibs, so you, you don't have, I mean, in Mexico, like a classic chocolate, like in the Molinos in, in Oaxaca, it's gritty. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love the, you know, the texture of the grit, and I have no problem with it because I sort of grew up on it, you know, with that and, you know, with hot chocolate in Mexico. But, but um, once people re- discovered that they could make smooth chocolate, that just completely yeah. changed the way that people consume chocolate and, and completely changed the market and opened up the market for chocolate bars. Mm. And that's the way, you know, the, you know, the world eats chocolate today. Because it's, it's something that's easily transportable, et cetera. And, and it keeps. It keeps, keeps well. Yeah. Exactly. I think now, it, there, is there a huge movement? And I, I know this. I mean, we're, I'm friends with Jacques Torres, and I just was with him, and he actually has property in the Yucatan in Quintana Roo where he actually grows his own cacao. I know that there's a huge movement for artisanal cacao farmers and, and people producing chocolate. Have you seen that in, your, in some of your research, Andy, that it's becoming more of a, a, a norm in the business, in, 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 the, in the commercial world of chocolate? Oh, yeah, it's, it's huge. I mean, 
what, I mean, what people are doing. So it's it's you know we call it the bean to bar chocolate movement, mm-hmm. and um, you know it begins in in the forests it, with with the cacao trees. And, um, you know, the problem with the farmers is that, that they can make the greatest chocolate in the world, but they're, you know, they're small farmers. How can they market it? How can they sell it? So, they're, so they're, you know, what's happened is that links are being forged between, like, small, you know, bean to, um, chocolate makers um, and the farmers in the forest. Mm-hmm. And um, that's, you know, that's what's, like, really helped, you know, the bean-to-bar chocolate uh, market grow. And um, the small the small chocolate makers, I mean, they, they search out like the best chocolates in the world. They go down to visit the farms and, you know, pick out the, you know, the, the beans that they want, you know, personally. And um, the quality has just it's just gotten so much better. And right now, I mean, there are literally thousands of bean to bar chocolate makers. I mean, you tried, mm. Zarelli, you tried to become one in a way yourself when you were trying to make it in, in, you know, yeah. here in Midtown Manhattan, yeah, exactly. which uh, didn't work. But I mean, here in, I mean, he, here in Brooklyn, I mean, yeah. you know, God knows how many there are. Yeah. And, and around the world, um, you know, I mean, apparently, actually, the only place where there aren't that many is Europe. Western Oddly Europe, enough, right? because they have Lint and Valrona and yeah, you know all the big things. It's like what you know, all like the big Belgian firms. Like, yeah. why do we need that? We just go to the store. I mean, we got great chocolate already. Do the tutores make a difference in the taste of chocolate? Do that, the, the tutores are the the shade trees that 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 protect the the beans as they grow, like coffee. I don't know. I mean, I think it's quite possible. I mean, you know, yeah. all these trees they grow and you know in in you know in sort of in synchronized with the rest of the of the environment around them. Yeah, like the bean, like the squash will grow over the tomatoes to protect them, and la la la. Right. You know the vines, um, but I think it's interesting because, like like so many different things, the way that ingredients migrate and they influence other cultures and cuisines. I think, you know, the Europeans need to know that chocolate is from Mexico. We put our fingerprint on it. It's migrated all over the world. So I think this would be very insightful for our, for our listeners, you know, to know that, you know. In the Bazar Sábado, you know, there's that wonderful right. market on, in San Angel. They were selling chocolate nibs and toasted cacao. So you could just buy it there and, and, mm-hmm. and not have to go through, through what we went through. Yeah. With a metate. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> this episode is brought to you by Appeal. Here at HRN, we care about reducing waste across our food system from farms to home kitchens. We know that about half of the produce we grow ends up in the trash. We all want to enjoy produce at peak freshness and reduce the amount that gets thrown away. That's where Appeal comes in. Appeal is a plant-based protective layer that helps produce last up to twice as long. It's edible, invisible, and imitates how peels naturally protect fruits and vegetables. Because here's the thing, Less waste doesn't just mean we're throwing less food away. It also means we waste less water, energy, and other resources that go into growing produce. Appeal works with nature to reduce waste across the food system from the farm to the kitchen. Appeal helps us conserve our precious resources to ensure we have fresh food to meet our growing need. Appeal, food gone good. Learn more at appeal.com. One of the things that you mentioned earlier that I think we should be uh, kind of spoken about is that once you harvest the bean, it starts to ferment. Is, there, is that because there's natural enzymes in it that will let well, it what, do that? What happens is, is that you it doesn't ferment naturally. If you mm. just take one bean and, and put it mm. on, a, on a table it'll, for two <laughs> weeks, it'll just dry out and, and yeah. turn to dust. So what you want to do is pile them up. You know, when you pile up a compost pile, or like if you go to a you know yeah. to a farm in the winter and you see a manure pile mm-hmm. and it's steaming, it's mm-hmm. because there's ferment because there's bacterial action going on there. Mm-hmm. So what you want to do is pile up the beans, like make them into a mound, so they're all sitting in in, to get in there, essentially rotting, but it's good rot. And um, and what it, what the beans are doing is fermenting, and that breaks down the compounds to make like the flavor compounds in the beans available okay. to us. Gotcha. 
So all those natural gases will start to occur and help break it down. One yeah. of the things that I loved about Oaxaca is when they're having a wedding or a party, the invitation is a pound of, well, a kilo of sugar, uh, some cacao beans, and this particular kind of bread. So that's the invitation. And then you a have pound to of sugar? Well, yeah, yeah, now. Uh-huh. But it's a cacao and the, cho- the, the chocolate and the, and the, what else did I say? Sugar? And there's one other thing. Maybe canela? Maybe. No. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I mean, the ratios of when I saw when I went to the, the Molinos and all that, they'd be putting a pound of sugar per like almost a pound of chocolate. <laughs> well, we're talking about you know, the Colombian exchange. You, you know, I mean, that's what the, the the Spaniards brought: canela, yeah. cinnamon, yeah, from, and from, and yeah. and and sugar because they love sugar. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, the champarado I, I I brought in today, mm-hmm. it's really sweet, yeah. and it's and it's got an, and more cinnamon taste than um, chocolate taste. Yeah. Um, but but the sugar is the thing which, um, you know, they brought. And, you know, what you were also we're talking about and with sugar and moles. Yeah. I mean, industrial mole is way, way too sweet. Oh, yeah. Totally. You know, so this is, I mean, that's, I mean, sugar, I wish they but would I, tone it down. But I think they're pandering to the American palate a lot of ways, you know. The some, U.S. palate. The U.S., yeah. I'm sorry, the U.S. palate. But, you know, where things are sweet, you know, that's why... Kendall Jackson Chardonnay is the number one sold wine because it, it's it's sweet. Right, it has a a, a very you know sweet flavor profile. And well, I have to say, you know, ha, ha, uh, mom, Andy, <laughs> this has been unbelievable. I think Andy, you have added so much, so much f- f- texture, flavor, flavor and <laughs> texture, and. And so much knowledge behind the subject of chocolate. I think we could do a whole season just on chocolate, on its unbelievable history and uh, its cultural uh, importance. I think this has been unbelievable. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Um, Because alone, one cannot share life. Yes, others must be You can eat chocolate alone. Yeah, Yeah. you can eat chocolate. I'm thinking right now, like, where am I going to get my next bar of chocolate? (laughs) Absolutely. And I think you're... I think the contributions that your family and yourself continue to make from a scholarly perspective to food only gives us better perspective as chefs and people that produce ingredients, that produce great food. If you have a knowledge of the ingredients, it's so much more enriching and more rewarding. So um, we thank you so much for your presence. Uh, Andy, how can people get in touch with you? Because I'm sure everyone's going to be knocking down the their keyboards to send you emails and continue to engage with you. Is there a website, an email people can reach well, out to? Well, the best way is I'm not very active on social media. Mm-hmm. LinkedIn is the best way Okay. to get get a hold of me through LinkedIn. So just put your name, Andy Yeah, and, and, and you'll see my beautiful face. And, Outstanding. And, uh, well, we, we think it's beautiful. I'm sure your wife does as well. So it's Andy, C-O-E, Co. Yes. Okay? Uh, look up Andy there. He's an absolute treasure trove of, it, of information and knowledge. Please really look him out. Uh, this has been unbelievable, talking about cacao to chocolate here on Cooking in Mexican from A to Z. We want to thank you all for listening and showing interest. My name is Aaron Sanchez. And I'm Sarela Martinez. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. Cooking in Mexican from A to Z is powered by Simple Cast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, and more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without your support from listeners like you. Want to be part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like. Tell your friends and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Yeah.